Hello everyone, I'm Daniel Hernandez, the Chicano Resource Center Librarian for LA County Library. I'd like to welcome you to our LA County Library virtual event, Artist Talk with Margaret Garcia. Chicano artist Margaret Garcia has been recognized as one of Los Angeles' most influential artists. Her artwork has been included in many exhibitions, and she has created public art throughout the Los Angeles area, including mural work for the 1984 Olympics and Metro Rail's Universal City Station. She teaches and lectures, and her works are in the collections of the LA County Museum of Art, the Laguna Art Museum, and the Cheech Marin Collection. Garcia sat down with curator Dulce Stein to discuss her life, painting, and hope for the future. We filmed the interview at Margaret's studio on the east side of Los Angeles. It is a wonderful space that reflects Margaret's colorful style. However, it is a storefront in the middle of a rich and active community. So please forgive the sounds of the city that may filter into the interview. Hi, my name is Dulce Stein. I am the chief curator of the Neutra Museum. We are here with Margaret Garcia at her studio to have a little conversation about her amazing art. Hi, Margaret. How are you? Hi, Dulce. Tell me a little bit about yourself, please. I was uh, born in East L.A. at the hospital down the street. My grandmother was born in El Paso, and on our matrilineal line, uh, we are descended from Tarumara, from my great-grandmother's side. And they came into the United States through Texas, but I also have ancestors that were, I can even say, Texas Rangers, you know, on this side of the border. So I come from both sides of the border, so I am a Chicana. And I was born here, and this is where my art is from. Where did you grow up? Uh, in Boyle Heights, uh, here. When I was born, uh, my parents lived on Gladys Street in the Gladys Hotel on Skid Row. And I was born down here at what was then called the General Hospital. It's now called County USC. Wow. And my grandmother worked there as a nurse. Wow. So cool. So how old were you? The first time that you realized you were in, in love with art or that you were in love with color or what was it the first thing that you remember about your journey as an artist? Well, my grandmother had a lot of art books in her home. So I was raised with that and she had some paintings as well. But I came home from school, uh, kindergarten, I think, with my drawing, my crayon drawing. And my father was like, oh, you're an artist. You're going to be an artist. And I thought, oh, that sounds good. I think I like that. And I think uh, I just embraced what my father told me about myself because it sounded positive. And, and he says, you know, you can be anything you want to be. And I think you're, you're an artist. And I believed him. It was that simple for me. My mother, it, it was a little more complicated with her. But with my dad, it was like, you can be anything you want. So you are a teacher, you're a world-renowned uh, artist, you represent the Chicano art movement, and you represent us all over the world. Uh, but I also want to ask you about uh, your murals. Muralism is so important. Uh, Arte para el pueblo, del pueblo. Uh, how uh, did you find yourself painting your first mural? Um, I ran into an elementary school friend, Carlos Gallegos, and he was connected with Citywide Murals and Glenna Avila, I think her name was Boltook back then, that was her maiden name. And uh, she basically um, was hiring to do murals and the prerequisite for the mural was that it had to have some kind of social significance at the time. And I was uh, working with Randy Giraldi, and the one social issue that we both felt an affinity for was the issue of uh, the whales and the overwhaling, especially because the Russians and the J Japanese were killing off a lot of the, the blue whales. They were becoming extinct, and so we were concerned about that. So I embraced that, and that was my first mural. It's uh, two blue whales 
on the corner of Beethoven in Venice in Mar Vista. And it came out in the Murmur movie with, um, done by Agnes Varda. What an awesome story. Is it still up? Yes. As a matter of fact, the people that bought the building were able to get a loan because the mural was up and no one ever graffitied it. It uh, doesn't get graffitied. And they showed that the, uh, that that particular building in that environment had some stability. So the Center for Independent Living purchased the, the building with the two blue whales on it. And they are a facility that helps people who have physical disabilities become independent people. Great. So well, they're perfect. Yeah. What a great mission. Uh, but that makes me think, whoa, what a uh, transition from saving whales, from uh, saving the environment to Chicano art, social justice uh, art. Well, you know, not everybody's going to do exactly the same thing. Um, as a Chicana, you know, I care about the farm workers. I love the Virgen de Guadalupe and Dia de los Muertos and Frida Kahlo. You know, that's all awesome. But we can't all have exactly the same message. I think that the more you read, the more educated you are, the larger your your scope of concern is, the more complex and complicated your message is going to be. And you can't just be held to what everybody agrees on. So you have to, you know, if you care about the environment or you may, you know, maybe you care about archaeology or anthropology or you care about the landscape architecture like my husband does or you care about science or you care about all those things. I think we have the ability to to show complexity and an interest in all those fields and they should all be available and open to every single one in this community. And included. Yeah. Yes. Thank so, you. How do you define uh, Chicano art? What does it mean uh, to you specifically, <laughs> personally? I, I, I've said this many times, <laughs> and uh, pardon me for sounding like a broken record. I define Chicano art by producing it. I can't produce Chinese art. I'm not Chinese. I am a Chicana, and therefore the art that I express, that I make, that I produce, is an expression of those things that I care about and that I'm concerned with. And yeah, I have a social consciousness about what's going on in my community and I care. And that shows up in the way that it shows up with the work that I do, whether it's because I do somebody's portrait and I care about the little girls in their little bit trajes and whether or not it's my neighbor or whether it's not a, a family member or even an, uh, an image of the community, the environment, the, the taco vendors, the fruit vendors, the, you know, the people working at night, uh, whatever that is, or the environment, the flowers, the greenery. I, I'm not real big on slogans on my paintings, you know, like I don't always have banderas and things like that. I participated in things like that, and I care about that. I did a painting for uh, the 43 Desaparecidos, and that did have some writing on it, and I do scratch words into some of my paintings. Uh, but not everything you do is a, a political agenda. You know, sometimes it's about expressing something that brings you comfort, that brings you... Uh, an expression of your spiritual journey. Yes. Yes. Tell me about your color, your color palette. How important is color in your work? Well, when, when I first started using oil paint, uh, I learned some of the most traditional color palette, which had umbers and ochres and uh, earth tones, because that's the way the Europeans used oil paint, and I learned it via people who had 
studied that way. And um, I did spend some time in Chicago doing um, color, or uh, do, doing uh, restoration of art. And there was a lot of European figurines and things like that, and that, that was there. But occasionally we got things from Indonesia, from Java, from China, from Africa, from Mexico. And the woman who trained me to do that restoration work said to me, if you go around the world and you look at art around the world, the, the art that is around the Ecuador, where there's beautiful butterflies and there's beautiful flowers and colors and things, you will notice that the art also becomes as colorful as the, the gardens and the flowers and the flora and fauna of those countries. And it, it develops a patina because it's loved and held and used and 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 it, that's how the African art especially develops that patina. If you look at the work of say Go, Gauguin, Paul Gauguin, right? And everybody says, oh this Frenchman invented the colorist movement in the fobs and all that. His mother was Peruana. He grew up in South America until he was the age of 10. His palette is from the Americas and his sensibility, that sense of color comes from that. The indigenous people of the Americas, you know, and the French can claim it all they want, but it's still a part of who we are. I mean, look at the Huipiles from uh, Oaxaca and Chiapas. I mean, this is from Chiapas, San Cristobal. The sense of color is there. It's part of our culture and it's part of the food we eat. It's part of the clothes we wear. It's the way we paint the buildings. It's all of it there. And that is my heritage. Are they, are they colors still to be discovered? Are you, <laughs> have you, how many colors have you created or discovered that well, are your own? Well, um, the, the, the prism is there. The colors are there. It's a question of whether or not you can capture that. Sometimes it's really tricky because you have you have the pigments you have, and you try to uh, uh, express something and show uh, the color. But you know, like when things are alive, uh, you can pick a leaf off, off a ginkgo tree, and it has a certain green. I took a leaf like that to the paint store and I asked him if they could he goes no 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 get away from me and I go he says well that one color green has like 10 different dots of different colors of green in it and the eye can see more shades of green than any other color so you're 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 trying to capture that sometimes you cannot capture the vibrancy of a color on till you put more of similar colors. It's almost like, you know, red isn't just red, it's alizarin crimson, it's red, uh, cadmium red deep, medium light, and it's the variation of the color that makes it look so vibrant. And to capture that vibrancy isn't just a flat thing. It, it isn't just that one color, it depends on the tonalities, it depends on the light, depends on the luminosity, how many layers, and and whether or not you can stack those colors in a way that the eye perceives it, and it perceives it in such a way that, you know, sometimes you're unaware, oh, it's red, but there are other lighter shades that are kind of glowing through that luminous paint of layer, you know, so I don't, I can't say I invented the wheel, but I will use it. <laughs> As I look around <clears throat> your masterpieces here in your studio, uh, I can't help but, but notice how wonderful your shadows and your paintings are. Uh, shadows usually by the dark, you know, the dark, you know, absence of colors, but your shadows are so colorful and alive. Mm. So uh, how do you work with uh, those dark colors to bring them alive? and colorful, full of life, full of light. 
You know, I guess we all have a little bag of tricks, right? You know. Um, Are you going to tell us your secret? <laughs> well, I'll, 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 I'll give it all. I mean, you know, I think it's there for the taking. I think um, the best artists always take from other artists. Um, I like to work in opposites. So if you know your color wheel, green is the opposite of red, yellow is the opposite of uh, purple, orange is the opposite of blue. And what you do is you, you position those colors back and forth so that um, if you're working in a shadow that's like purple, you want to have a little bit of yellow there to make it a little more purple and make it a little deeper. And sometimes it's about layering it. So sometimes I will put uh, an indigo blue underneath the purple and the top layer will be kind of purple, but the yellow on the top will vibrate the purple and you're unaware of that deep indigo, but it's there. Uh, I eliminate uh, black from my palette. I eliminate um, tubes of brown paint, <laughs> umbers, ochres, red sienna, uh, raw sienna. I eliminate those colors, and if I want to, if I want a shade of that kind of brown, I do it by juxtaposing, uh, say, purple and red, and and layering opposites over each other so that you have a luminous glow of the, the, the paint. And I try, uh, well, I, when, I, when I teach, I often tell students they can't use white because they have to learn the value of that color, like what shade of light are we dealing with? And they don't learn it because they keep trying to mix things with black and white to make them that dark and that light with with no attention to the color. So I make everybody work in color to begin with so that they understand the value of it. So if you were to paint me, what color would be my <laughs> shadow? I, there'd be a lot of colors in there. My shadow. Your shadow. Your would shadow me? has a lot of color. <laughs> There's a lot of colors in there. It isn't one thing. Thank you. So um, my question, I guess, would be, as a teacher, you teach and you lecture all over the country. Uh, as a teacher, uh, what would be the message that you would like uh, generations to come to listen to, to learn, or to embrace as a master Chicano artist? I, I think um, for me the most important message that I had to learn as an artist, as a human being, is that my experience was valid, that I had a contribution to make, that I had the skill with which to make it. And those three things are important in terms of letting our kids know that everything has not been set, everything is not set in stone, you have a contribution to make. There are other people who have said that before you said it, or said it this way, or you learn. It's okay to learn from another person. You don't have to take credit for the wheel. You don't have to invent the wheel. And talent is an overrated concept. Um, you may have all the talent in the world, but if you don't practice it, if you don't exercise that talent, it doesn't mean anything. What matters most is your desire to attain that skill level. So it's about doing it and doing it and doing it. It's not about the outcome, it's about the act. I read your statement about uh, the prayers, the prayers exhibit. And uh, you said something to the effect that uh, when you're painting, you are in the state of meditation, of holiness, of, uh, of connection. It, it, you know, sometimes we suit up. We suit up and we show up, right? You know, like whether you're a runner, a jogger, or a musician for that matter. Whatever it is that you do, and sometimes you don't feel like suiting up. You don't feel like doing laps. You don't feel, but you, you show up, you suit up. 
in the best of moments, sometimes you get into that rhythm. Sometimes you get into that headspace and that spiritual place where you're working and you forget time. You forget what you're trying to accomplish even. You don't have to think, oh, it's this color and that color and this and that. It, it, it exudes, you know, it comes out of you like an expression of, of the way you feel because you're in touch with the way you feel. It's a rhythm, you know, when you paint and it has shake in it and the, the brush strokes are shaking. That's your pulse, your pulse, that's your heart. It's like a polygraph. It expresses the way you feel about what you're painting and if it's in front of you and you're connected to it. I can't claim that each and every single time I've sat down to paint that I've made a, a masterpiece or that I'm always connected or something doesn't disturb me. But in my best of moments, I'm in a state of grace. I find that um, most artists, if not all artists, are always uh, looking for to achieve a masterpiece. What others would look at and say, oh my God, this is the greatest art ever. I think we all looking for that. But what is a masterpiece to you? What what are the elements of a masterpiece? And I'm not talking about skill, or I'm not talking about um, uh, medium. Right. I I like to um, I I like to reflect on the things that Joseph Campbell talked about when he talked about art. There are three kinds of art. There's art that is made out of really expensive material, and you know, it's made out of gold or silver and it's, you know, elaborate and it has, you know, 2,000 man hours and they took toothpicks and they stacked them from here to there and it was a feat, you know, it's like it's worth so much, right, you know. And, and, and there is art that is just labor intensive. It doesn't necessarily mean that it says anything or it's decorative, you know, it's pretty, it looks pretty on the wall. It's the right colors, it's the right shapes. And then there is art that when you look at it, it enlightens you. You look at it and you have an epiphany and you say, oh, I've, I've felt like that. I've, I've seen that. I've shared that vision. It, it has moved me. I'm not alone in this world. And I have experienced life in the same way that that artist has experienced life and has shown me an appreciation for my very existence. And that is the highest form of art. Not whether it's made out of gold, not whether you spent 2,000 hours on it, not whether it's decorative and pretty, but whether or not it gives you an understanding of the human condition and moves you to appreciate it. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Margaret, for sharing all this time with us uh, for the Chicano Resource Center. I would like to ask you one more question. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, uh, it would be a personal question. Uh, what are your hopes for the near future as a community? Uh, what can we do to cheer up each other, especially in this time of uh, uncertain, uh, uncertainty? Uh, how can art help us uh, through this pandemic? And how can it help us um, express ourselves uh, in a positive way. Maybe that's more than one question, but you know, you understand what I'm trying to do. Well, I, I'll try. Uh, I will do my best. I can say, um, I found a quote in a book, and I bought the book just because that the quote was on the cover of the book, and it said, art is the last great hope. You know, um, and uh, whether you're talking about the blues, or you're talking about Chicano art that's real rascuache, <laughs> as Magoo would say, if you're, you're talking about uh, art that expresses 
the deepest concerns and and uh, spiritual hopes and love for this community. Um, for me, anything that's hateful, I want to distance myself from. And there is a lot of divisiveness right now. And it's, they have this, and we don't have that, and uh, it's real easy to get caught up in, uh, yeah, but it's worse for us, or it's, you know, these comparisons that, that don't work. Uh, for me, we are the same people. I mean, I didn't grow up as an African American or somebody who's Asian or Filipino. I grew up as a Chicana. But I don't necessarily believe that there are different races of people. I, I think we have different culture. I think we have different customs. And I think that until we start looking at each other as human beings, and you know, art shows your humanity. It shows your aesthetic. It shows what you love and what you like and uh, <clears throat> what you care about. So without that, we have nothing. I mean, I, I think the next generation needs to have the freedom to define themselves on the terms that they need to define themselves. And though I sometimes disagree with some of the millennials, I, I believe that they should be empowered to, to have that freedom and have that discussion. Empowered to tell their story. Definitely. And that their story? Matters. Yes, of course. Well, thank you very much. We appreciate it. And smile to that cow. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. We hope you've enjoyed the Margaret Garcia interview with Dulce Stein. If you would like to know more about Chicano artists or want more information about upcoming virtual programs, please visit us at lacountylibrary.org.